So having heard about some of the future uh, possibilities, and many of which are here, uh, we're now going to talk about Australia's fisheries management ensuring seafood for future generations. And we've gathered together a panel. So we've got Jane Lovell, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Seafood Industry Australia. Uh, Jane is a scientist by training. She's worked in many industries, including, uh, including horticulture, um, and in the fisheries portfolio with, um, with Richard Colbeck. Um, we have Caleb Gardner, because Colin Buxton unfortunately uh, had to pull out at the last moment, but we're excited to have Caleb because he's the professor and the director of sustainable marine research at IMAS. And, uh, and he tells me that he's uh, looking forward to watching the crows uh, this weekend. So he, like the minister, is, uh, is a crow supporter. Uh, we have uh, Colin Tannehill, who's the Managing Director of uh, Shimano Australia Fishing uh, and is also the pres President of the Australian Fishing Trade Association, AFTA, um, and is a, an enthusiastic recreational angler, angler, but is also interested and has been around um, the seafood industry uh, for quite a while. Um, and then we have Stan. Stan Louis is a Torres Strait Islander from Erib, um, which is located in the top eastern Torres Strait. Um, he's a graduate of James Cook and he's here uh, in his role as chair of the Fisheries R&D Corporation Indigenous Reference Group. So we have a nice cross-section of, of different sectors and different perspectives. Um, and so what I'm going to do is ask them in turn to just give us one or two minutes, or even three, if you're good, um, to talk about their, their initial comments on the topic of Australia's fisheries management ensuring seafood for future generations. I'm then going to ask a few questions, and it's at that point that I'll be really be looking for some... Uh, some feed coming in, some questions from the floor, so that it becomes more of a conversation rather than a presentation PowerPoint um, situation. So I'm going to give Jane the first opportunity to talk and then move on to the others. So Jane. So this is, oh, this is working. Um, thank you, delighted to be here. Uh, first official gig, I guess, in front of a big crowd as CEO um, and supposed to be speaking on behalf of the industry. So um, I'll be looking for a bit of support from the floor at some stage, I'm sure. But I think, to, to answer the question, Jane, I think uh, for us, uh, for Seafood Industry Australia, I would reflect on the members' advisory forum that we had yesterday. And the key issue, the number one issue that came out of that is so social licence. We've heard a bit about that already this morning. Um, I think that's something that we have to earn, but we also need to promote. Uh, and I note that it's also in one of the, one of the um, issues that the minister brought up. So to have a future as a seafood industry, we really need to have strong community support. Um, and to have that community support, there's a number of things that I guess we need to get, we need to get right. Um, I would just reflect on um, one of the big issues, I guess, that have influenced me in terms of being involved with the industry, and that was the super trawler debate. And without going through that blow by blow, um, I think one of the things that really highlighted to me was there was a my expression, a lack of an emotional bank account between the industry and the community. So when a negative came our way, um, it was accepted. Um, it, it wasn't challenged. Um, we, had, we had really good science, but we weren't able to get that message out um, clearly enough, and perhaps that's because science and maths is, are not the most popular um, topics at schools, in schools, so we, you know, we have an issue there. But for me, social licence is all about building that emotional bank account, painting the positive pictures. So if we get a knock, if something goes a bit awry, the community doesn't automatically um, demonise us uh, and accept everything that comes from that negative angle, that they pause and at least try to seek an alternate view and and I would like to think seek the truth in the argument. So that's for me the most important thing. Excellent. So building an emotional bank account, I'm sure we could explore what that might look like over these next few minutes. So Caleb. 
So on that, that main point of just ensuring supply of seafood, um, I'm not sure that in some ways is, is so much of a challenge. We have, in the sense that we have, um, well, let's see, in most, of, most of my working world in, in looking after sustainable fisheries development to Tasmania is more around the seafood that people are having trouble to sell. Um, and we have a lot of stocks of, let's see, James just mentioned small pelagics, um, there are sardines, um, there's the issue of carp from the Murray at the moment. There's a lot of seafood which we have large volumes of, but it's just that lower, um, lower desirability. So in terms of running out of seafood, we're not going to, we've got plenty. Um, the other challenge for the, one, the species that are highly desirable, and those are the ones where we need the science, of course, to, to, to manage them well, because um, they're the ones with the economic pressures on them. Um, but I just also, um, you know, the opportunity to, to talk about the, the policy statements that have, have just been released. Um, I think if we're talking about um, ensuring supply, and there seems to be a lot of focus on that, the minister emphasised consumers and mums and dads wanting seafood on the table. Um, that's, that's clearly important for public support for seafood industries. But I think a lot of our policies in, in fisheries uh, management around Australia are much more focused on the producer rather than on the consumer. Um, and this is somewhere where we run the risk of, of losing that community support. So for example, we have policies, um, and it's in the, the current policy statement, to put a much greater emphasis on maximising the economic yield. Now that's very good for the, the, the producer, but it does mean that you're reducing supply to consumers, and you're also pushing up the price to Australian consumers as well. So um, that's not so good for, for public support. Um, and there's a, there's a whole suite of other, um, you know, I could go on, but there's a whole suite of other issues that relate to, um, we're very much more focused on, on delivering benefit back to the producers. And there's some nuances about the way which we do this, which where we, we are real, you know, real obstacles for us going forward. Things like foreign ownership, um, how much of the rents that we, um, we export overseas, to what extent do we start reducing labour in Australia to try to raise rents from our seafood industries, which is very good if you can invest it back into the community, but if we're, if we're dissipating that or just losing it overseas, then, then we're no longer getting the community benefit from our seafood industries that we should. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we've got an idea around building, needing to build an emotional bank account. We've had a call for a rethink about policies and how policies should really expand beyond the producer to include impacts on consumers. That's some good points there. Colin. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, letting us be here this morning on behalf of the Australian Fishing Trade Association. Obviously, we're recreational fishing orientated. Uh, most of our members uh, run retail shops or wholesale businesses to provide the opportunity for people to fish. Uh, we certainly understand that the waterways need to be shared. Uh, we support that totally. Uh, we often have um, the opportunity where we might suggest that we prefer a different mode, but that's the way it is, and I think it's fair that everyone should be able to represent their own rights in the way that they look at that. Um, for me, the key thing is to have access. If we all have the access to the waterways and we can all enjoy the opportunity to fish those waterways together, then it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, the one point that really sticks out for me in the similarities between the Seafood Industry Association and the AFTA organisation is the retail element. Um, if we don't have stock, our retail businesses can't run. In the case of your retail stores, they need to have seafood, that's their stock. Um, in the case of our fishing tackle stores, they need to have fish that people can go and catch by buying our gear to go and catch the fish. So at the end of the day, we need the, we need the stock in the stores to be able to retail the stores. So I think it's really important that we all understand sustainability is the number one thing that we all must make sure of. And, you know, we all need to give a little bit at times. So um, the other thing I think that's really important is communication. Uh, I think to start these type of conferences and to... St I've had a, a meeting already with Veronica and um, the Minister um, and also to have these communications where we can start to join the dots and, and share our goods and our bads and our uglies together so that we can try and work out the best way together. So. Thanks, Colin. So some good points there around the commonality of some of the issues and, and finding those, those points of commonality and how we can work together. Interesting about the waterways as well. Um, Craig mentioning that uh, disputes over water, water is going to become the most uh, you know, um, disputed 
probably um, resource mm. in the future. So that's very, very timely. Um, so Stan, some yeah, opening wait. remarks from you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks again for inviting me to come and speak on the panel. So uh, today I'm here in my capacity as a chair of the Indigenous Reference Group for the FRDC, and we're now a, a sub-program. We've got, um, you know, we've worked to a terms of reference where uh, the members are not representational. It's based on experience uh, and knowledge. Uh, we've got, we work to a set of principles, five principles that we've developed, and it's around capacity building, uh, socioeconomics, uh, those sorts of things that I think that are general in all of the industries. Um, I think after after watching that um, the talk on future trends and and those type of technologies, when you look at our uh, communities and how our people live in our communities, that, that's that's real space age kind of for them to have a look at that and and apply that to to actually where they're living. It, that would just blow people away. Um, so one of the things for us, when we talk about uh, new technologies and things like that, I think basic infrastructure is a is an issue for us out in out in our communities, um, and it's about building those infrastructures just support, to support some some fishing industries and businesses. Uh, one of the good things that we've come from the rec sector is that like they they come out the rec fishermen come out and 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 to have rec fishers come out and experience, have an experience, a good experience out on country, it causes this uh, need to improve infrastructure. So that's a, that's, I see that as a good thing. Um, another thing for us is when you talk to, to Indigenous people about building businesses and business capacity and things like that, they talk in stories. We talk in stories. We tell a story about fishing. We tell a story about that sort of thing. But the problem with telling stories is it's a good thing and it's you know captures your audience and that sort of thing but when you when you try and apply for funding and things like that is how do you pull metrics out of a story to take a, a business application into the bank to say I want to start a business when you've got a story and so that's a challenge for us as well is how do you pull metrics out of a story um, uh, another big thing for us which is uh, which is talked about in all sorts of forums is welfare. How do we compete with welfare? How does the seafood industry compete with welfare? It's really hard. Uh, it's a big question. I don't have the answers. I don't, like, and that question will continue, but I think if we just keep thinking about it, when people fish, it's, it's seasonal or it's weather dependent and it just depends on what your business model is and whether you're in a small dinghy or in a big boat, you, you still can't go and fish five days a week. You can't, you don't have a salary, it's not like you can budget a salary. And so people depend on welfare. And then when you earn a certain amount of money, your, you, you, your welfare is impacted, your, your rent goes up and all those sorts of things. So, so they're the big things for me is yeah, well, we just can't compete with that. Yeah, so there's some very chunky um, issues there around uh, competing with welfare. That's an interesting comment, really, and one that I certainly hadn't thought about, but I guess it's out there. Um, and that gap between the reality of, of where we are now and, and the sort of stuff we just saw um, in the first session, just trying to figure out, well, how do we get there from where we are now? So I think um, through all of that, uh, even though you're from different parts, there's some, a, a lot of commonality in, in, how you, in some of the issues, but also maybe coming from a different perspective. In the policy itself, um, it talks about Commonwealth fisheries are a shared resource between commercial recreation and indigenous fishers. How do you see that sharing playing out over the next 10 years or so in terms of you know, issues that might come to the fore. I mean, it's all, it's all good to say, yes, we're all going to work together, we're all going to be happy families, but I mean, the reality is there's going to be conflict. So how do we deal with that? Uh, comments from anybody, really? <laughs> um, 
can, can I just say yep. like, there are there are science based approaches to trying to solve those, um, which is that you try to you know maximise the welfare of, of all those different sectors. So that's a science based approach, but because it never happens because these things are always political. So. Um, um, that is that is the reality, and there's some some been some excellent research done, well funded by FRDC. There was the you know wonderful work, work, work by Tor looking at you know who's how valuable is you might fish. Um, so you can do, go through these processes, but to actually go through the allocation is, is clearly very difficult. There's also can I just say also there's another fourth group as well, which are the people who live in Australia, um, who are the owners of the resource, but neither recreationally fish um, either as recreationals or um, well, they don't culturally fish, um, and they're not commercial fishers as well. So they're they're another important group, and in fact that's the bulk of the Australian community. You know, that's the largest group really, and they need some consideration also. Um, and okay. so, yeah. so, Colin, you might want to comment on that. Yeah, we, we sponsor a junior apprentice fishing guide, pro, Indigenous guide program up in Melville Island, um, which we're very proud of, part of the Hayden Reynolds Tiwi College project. And we've got three apprentice guides that we're teaching to become recreational fishing guides so that they can actually have it as a job. And it's not just a short-term um, teaching process, it's a long-term teaching process. So. The point I'm trying to make here is coming through the, the system of education from the ground up is where we also need to go. We can all join in at our particular age or our particular stage of life, but we need to invest in the future and we need to educate the future to understand that we've got to be shared resource or to understand that we've got to give and take or understand how we've got to try and do things to make it you know, sustainable. And those, those young people coming through can be educated on scientific facts but they can also be educated on the emotional element because we can never forget the emotional power of actually being on the water. Whether you're commercial fishing or recreational fishing, the power of being on the water, what it does for oneself, is really strong. And anyone who un who's been there and understands it knows what I'm talking about. So, so there is a scientific factor to it, I agree, but there's also the human element that I think we need to try and take through from the ground up with the kids. So. Yeah, so the... This you were just talking about emotions and, and Stan was talking about stories and Jane, you talked about building an emotional bank account. How, how does that happen? How does one build an emotional bank account? Well, you, it, it's just like a normal bank account. You have really? to make, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> simple, really. Um, so it's how not, do you put deposits? Yeah, so, so I guess that's exactly what it requires. It requires for you to put deposits um, in to actually build um, a positive um, balance so that if a negative comes, it takes a little bit away, but it still leaves it in the positive. So if you think about um, you've got a friend, um, you trust them, you spend a lot of time getting to know them, you pat each other on the back. Um, when they do something that makes you a bit cranky, you don't automatically go to the extreme of saying, well, they're an idiot and bagging them out mercilessly. You, 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 can, you no, <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, that's really? my definition of friend, um, <laughs> that they forgive you a little bit, that there's a little bit of give and take in the relationship. So, um, so the way that I think we need to build that emotional bank account is we sort of end up talking at cross purposes. We go in with our agenda and we're, we're busy pushing that and we're not actually perhaps taking the time. This is going to be an issue for Seafood Industry Australia because clearly our members will have... Um, some, some things that they don't all agree on. Mm. We're actually going to have to put this in practice within the organisation. So we have to find ways um, that we can have the, the, the conversation, that we can understand somebody else's perspective and, and really try and move... You've got a position over here and a position over here. We need to try and find the way that we can get those two positions closer together. So, so for me, if you can build the relationship, you build the positive emotional bank account, when you have um, areas where you, where you don't agree, you don't automatically go to being extreme in your response. Yeah. So yeah. it's trying to go to that balance. Does that, does that sort of make sense? It makes sense to me, but what about... I mean, maybe that also goes to your point, Stan, about the stories and, mm. and how do you put a, a metric around that? Well, maybe that's how you put a metric around it. Mm. It's those stories that become part of the deposit in the bank account. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think Australia, in terms of Australia's seafood, it's a great story. Mm. You know, we've got, we've got commercial fishes. Um, you know, the, fish, the, the fishery is sustainable. 
commercial fishers are taking more responsibility on how they manage their fishery. And it's great. I, I think it's fantastic. It's a good story. We've got good management in place, management working with fishers. Then we've got, we've got the rec sector who are providing an experience, who are providing that, those, those values, those experiences when they go out into remote places in there. And people are getting, they're, they're coming from overseas to come and go for a fishing safari in Australia. Like, I mean, that's a good experience. And then we have the indigenous history of the, of the country. You know, we've got that connection with the fishery, with, with I especially like what you raised, Veronica, and you, you talked about our families, supporting families. And one of the things that I really was key with me is that fishers, commercial rec, indigenous, go out and fish and provide fish for those who, who can't, who aren't able to go out and fish. And I think that's, that, that's, that really struck a chord with me, so. Mm. Mm. We've got some questions. Thank you very much for feeding the questions through. So we've got some from the audience. Um, the first one I'm going to ask is um, just if we can get some thoughts from the panel on country of origin labelling um, and, and how that impacts on the image of industry, both maybe positive and negative. Yeah. That actually followed your comment about um, emotional bank account when, when you said that it came up here on the feed, so maybe you should start, Jane. Well, um, so I was really interested in what Stan was saying about stories because I think, um, I think probably we've been too much on the facts and what we can physically bank and not enough on the story. Um, so I think that to me goes to social licence. So country of origin is a story, that's what it is. Um, people want to know. Um, where food's coming from, um, but we can do more than just say, oh, it's, you know, it's from this place. We can tell the story about that place. Uh, and mm. so for me, it, country of origin is, is a fundamental piece of information that hooks us to a story so, to help grow um, So it really sales. gives us an opportunity while we're having the discussion about country of origin to tell those stories, to get those stories out Correct. there. Yeah. 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 yeah, so do... Yeah, so it's not just um, a no, no brand product, it's actually, there's pride behind the production of that product. And there are great and strong Australian stories that we should be telling. And technology will help us with that. So blockchain, I think um, Nick Rains is going to talk about that. But there are, as we saw in the, with the previous presentation, just think about the ways that technology will be able to tell those stories rapidly mm. for consumers. Yeah. Other panel members want to comment on the country of origin? I have just one thing I'd like to add, if I may, that it's great to see that happening. I think it's fantastic as a consumer of seafood that we'll be able to identify because it's been something in the past that my own family have had a problem with. So I'm very happy to see that progressing. I'd also like to say that I'd love to see something similar in fishing bait. Um, you know, we've got a situation where our anglers are using bait at times and we're using local prawn or but where's local prawn from? Or we're using prawn that's frozen in a packet and we don't know where it's from. So I think it'd be you know, fair if that carried on on both sides of the coin and also managed to find its way into uh, fishing bait. I think so. I yep, Sam. The night when we first uh, arrived in Sydney, we were having dinner um, in the restaurant and I was looking at the menu and there was different seafood on the menu and I was talking to my colleagues and I said, so where do you think this one comes from? And, and they're saying, oh, that might be imported. And I said, okay, so I'm not going to have that. And ended up going down all the seafood and so I had the kingfish and I had the bugs, the Balmain bugs. And they were the ones that people said, oh, no, they're probably from local, they're probably from, they're caught in Australia. And so they're the ones that I ate. And so I think country of origin is really important but on the other aspect of that, I think the seafood industry needs to be really proud of the product that we're putting out that other countries want to label their product Australian. <laughs> I mean, that says a lot for the industry. Jane, it's, it's clearly, it's clearly makes a lot of sense marketing. Um, I know, there, I know it's, it's more complex than it seems. Mm. There's nuances to having label, uh, country of origin labelling, um, so it's not always that easy. Um, but it's... Uh, 
the and so as a marketing exercise and a marketing tool, it it's clearly makes a lot of sense if it can be done well. Um, if it starts getting used as part of the story about having Australian seafood industries are, are helping put food on the table and feed Australians, it's and it's part of the story about you know we're, we're catching food for those who can't go fishing. It starts becoming pretty tricky because we're on thin ice. You know we really are in the Australian seafood industry. We've we export most of our, our high value seafood because there are buyers overseas who we can get a price from. So our, our motivation for having our industries is not just to put food, food on the plate, it's to have profitable industries. Now that's quite different. Um, and we, you know, as I was saying earlier, we reduce the supply of seafood to, through, through targeting maximum economic yield. And the, one of the points of that is to drive down the costs, and that means reducing regional impacts and, and labour. Um, it also means pushing the price up to consumers. Um, so those are things which we do, and they make business sense. Um, but it's difficult to weave into a story that we're, we're helping put food on the table of those who cannot go out and catch it. Um, and it's an interesting place to be in. We, there are not many other, in, I, don't think, I don't think there's any other food which is a government would step in and try to raise the price of to consumers as we do when we, we target MEY. Um, and, and promoting export of, of, um, of food as well is an interesting thing. I mean, that that's, works very well for us because we import as well. This is all part of being part of the global economy. Um, but it's, it, it's difficult for the, the bank account of social acceptance. The Australian gas industry was on the front page of the newspaper again today. So you can see the public does not like stuff being exported out of the country always. Um, I think there's good reasons to do it, but we just need to be careful. So you're, you're uh, suggesting some caution about some of the claims that are, are being made. So I'm saying that's right. There's two ways. I'm, I'm trying to say there's two ways which you can split this story. So one is as uh, if you want to buy good, healthy seafood and you want to be sure there's not all the antibiotics or other chemicals in it that we believe there is in from imported seafood and we're concerned about, that makes a lot of sense. But using as a, an argument a part of trying to develop a story that we are, we, you know, we, we should be well supported by the community because we are vital to feeding the community and that's what other countries like Japan and Spain do with their seafood industries. That's a very strong and defensible message there. That's trickier for us. Yeah. So. <sighs> Along that same theme, there's a question from the floor about that uh, it says that given food security issues and the large biomass of carp available, and you mentioned that there are some some fish that we don't target or, or is not targeted, shouldn't we utilise it instead of trying to get rid of it? What's that? Did you want to make a comment on that? Oh, um, I think everyone would agree. Yes. Um, clearly, yeah. One of, so, there is, in terms of increasing production, there's a lot do, of fish. Does everyone agree, though? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think most uh, recreational fishers would think that, you know, carp are a nuisance in a way uh, compared to native species of Murray cod or yellow belly, uh, those sort of species that have been affected by, the, you know, the, the infiltration of carp. But there's a lot, there are still a lot of recreational anglers who enjoy fishing for carp because they're good fun to catch. But no one looks to eat them. Maybe small pelagics might be a better one. <laughs> Less controversial. Question from the floor. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments on, the, on that one? No? I, I, I'd just say uh, that I wouldn't want people to think that um, when we talk about country of origin that it's about um, vilifying imported products. Um, you know, I think there's, there's evidence that uh, there are some fantastic products that come in from overseas. Um, and in fact, some of them may even be called out by their country of origin because it's a great country. Um, and I also think we need to be a little bit careful with um, making an assumption that everything that comes in is full of antibiotics or has got some problem with it. Um, I'm sure that there are instances of that, but I, you know, I, I, I just get a little bit worried that I wouldn't want this to be some sort of xenophobia. So, yeah, yep. we, we need to eat imported fish as well. Mm. We've only really got time for, for one more, so I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to, have to choose out of... Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for putting so many questions forward. But um, I think what I'd like to do is to sort of loop back to what um, Craig was talking about. So he talked about eight future technologies um, that are going to uh, impact on seafood. I'd just be interested in your views. Um, 
what do you see the best way for industry to start adapting to this future? It really speaks to your comment there, Stan, about you know the reality versus the future. There seems to be a long gap. How are we going to fund it? Where, how, you know, where's the investment going to come from? And and what are we going to do? What's the pathway? It's that's not that. just set. That's for everybody to to respond to. What's the pathway to the future? So that's a hard one, I think. Um it's exciting, and I'd like to be involved somehow. Um, but, and, and I don't want to say that reality is a bad thing, or it's, a, it's not all bad. Um, but some of those technologies that he that he put up there was was kind of mind blowing. And one of the ones that I saw was where oh, particular interested me was was the on the conveyor belt and it cut up all the pieces and everything like that. But the pieces of fish that were packaged looked, they were all exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you buy in a cardboard box. It looked like something that you would buy in a cardboard box um, out of the freezer compartment in, in a Woolies or something like that. It, it looked too manufactured. That was one of the things that jumped out at me, and because you know, some, like, not all of us can fillet fish, and you know, some of us do a terrible job of it. But you can see it's fresh fish because we've done a terrible job at filleting it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so could I could I jump in on that one? Um, that was also the one that I thought was most exciting. And one of the reasons I thought that was particularly exciting was um, in our discussions around, sorry to bring it up again, but country of origin labelling, one of the criticisms that's raised is that um, the Australian industry isn't able to provide um, food service that, that standardised product. So if they've got to cook 25,000 meals and they all need to be cooked you know, for exactly the same length of time. You can't say, oh, this one needs about, you know, 30 seconds longer than that. To get the food out, they need that consistency of product. And that's one of the reasons mm. that products are being imported, because we can't do that. So if you flip it on its head and think, if we could get a couple of those machines, I love, the, I love them saying it was the cutting edge, like that was clever. Um, <laughs> uh, if we could get some of those here, maybe that transforms part of the market sector. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know what carp tastes like, but maybe that's where the carp goes. So I think there's enormous opportunity with that. I don't know how you get it to happen. Money. Money, yeah, that helps. <laughs> so that, I, I thought it was great, that, and yeah, I agree, but that was a particularly good example of the way that modern technology is reducing wastage. Yeah. Um, and so in, Along the seafood supply chain, there's wastage all the way, like it is just with any food production, and the biggest wastage is right at the end when people buy the stuff and put it in their fridge and don't eat it and throw it out. Um, we're losing something like 30% of our seafood just through that process, I understand. Um, and the more efficient we can get along all those steps, um, you start actually reducing demand. So, you know, you, a person doesn't need to buy so much seafood if you're not throwing out 30%. Um, so that's going to be an interesting change in, in our operating world. Um, it's going to make it harder to sell carp, of course, and, and small pelagics. But, um, yeah, I mean, that, that will be interesting. The other thing I wondered too about was just I think that the... depends on whether you like carp or you don't, doesn't yeah, it? Uh, <laughs> I don't think you do. <laughs> <laughs> I like catching them. Um, the, um, the other thing too, I just wonder about whether... I think it's going to... I think we move, we'll be much better at being able to reduce our impact on the environment when, with aquaculture or fishing as well. You know, technology to avoid sensitive areas if we're, when, we're, when we're operating. There's, there's going to be huge developments in that space as well which is very positive. Yeah. I know you're running out of time, Jane, but I'll be quick if I may. Yep. Uh, it's, I don't think it's a case of how much will it cost to do it. It's a matter of how much will it cost not to do it. Uh, you know, I work for a Japanese company and they certainly do invest and look ahead. Um, I recently was fortunate enough to go and do a factory tour with 20 of our dealers from Australia and Shimano recently spent $160 million on one factory um, the factory, I don't know exactly how many robots are in there, but I'm going to have a guess at 60. Um, there's a dozen uh, humanless forklifts. There's, everything's humanless. The warehouse is humanless. We don't need lights. We don't need heaters. We don't need anything. It just all happens in the dark. Um, and the goods to person, um, all the orders come out and they're all goods to person. So 
When I first visited the factory in Shimano about 13 years ago, there were probably 400 people in the factory. Uh, the factory I visited recently, which has been rebuilt, there would not be 50. Uh, but what Shimano has done is invested its money into educating its people. So we're turning ourselves into an intelligence centre in Japan there. So those people can try and work out how we can make a better product or provide a better service for the community. So with the products that we provide. I'd also just say in relation to the technology, uh, we've all mentioned wastage and reducing uh, wastage, that's correct. But there's also the QC factor. It's QC factor becomes really strong when you've got the control over a robot that doesn't have that human element. So, so I think it's a case of really how much it would cost not to try to explore that avenue. So. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think the, the future is, is going to be pretty amazing. Um, so, but um, I do, we are running out of time. In fact, we have run out of time. But I'm just going to give each of our panel members the opportunity to have the last word. I'm going to start with you, Stan. Just what's the key message you want everybody here to remember uh, in terms of your perspective about the future? So, so I think uh, the seafood industry will need to take responsibility um, th there are many uh, facets to the industry and there's many different focuses. Um, but I think as a united industry, we're, it's, it's, it's a strong voice and it's a good story. Yep. Colin. Uh, for me, I'd have to say the right to fish, the access to fish and everybody having some compassion to the situation and the, and the needs of others being prepared to explore that. Yep. Um, all right, I'd say um, don't accept sustainability as being an acceptable outcome from our fisheries management. Um, that's a good outcome, but it's not enough and we need to be targeting and being much more ambitious than that. That's a challenge, yep, yeah. great. And, yep. Yeah. Uh, probably sort of going back to where I started, I think it's really important that we continue to, to talk to each other and try and understand the different perspectives. Um, a future without hostility and fighting and sensational headlines is one that I look forward to. Absolutely.